Hello and welcome. Welcome to this gathering. Um, this event is called Sharing Our Stories, Indigenous Identity in the Christian Church, and it features leaders from the Anglican Church of Canada and the United Church of Canada. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead with the United Church of Canada, and I'm one of the people who is coordinating the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, of which this is a part. The event that was previously scheduled on countering anti-Semitism has been postponed for a later date. Uh, tonight we have a panel uh, that will engage us in conversation, um, but first just a few words about the 40 days. Um, this live event is one of several live events that's been taking that is taking place and is being recorded, uh, so the video is available for wide sharing. There are also several uh, written reflections that are offered every day and available on the website. As well, there are some books that are featured. Um, so this is the this week's event. There are several of, of the writers who are featured here. Um, this live event and the featured book is called The Other Side of the River from Church Pew to Sweat Lodge. And this featured book, book was written by um, Elder Alf Dumont, uh, who's also a United Church minister. Uh, it's available from the United Church bookstore. And if you choose to order two or more books from the bookstore um, using the discount code 40 days, uh, you will receive a discount of 20% off. Uh, this book will be a great companion to the conversation that we're going to be having this evening. So um, feel free to pick up a copy. Uh, just to note, all the resources for the 40 days are available on the website, and we'll post that in the chat afterwards. Um, the panelists are asking that um, after we, I will introduce the panel in a moment, and after the end, we're asking um, that question and answers take place at the end. Uh, so if it's possible to um, not post questions in the chat yet, um, that will happen at the end of the evening. Um, there's a bit of information that I'll share at the chat in the beginning, um, but then after that, if we can just hold off on the chat until the very end. So with that, I um, would love to introduce two of my staff colleagues, Martha and Tim, who both work in the Indigenous Ministries and Justice Unit um, of the United Church's National Office. They will introduce themselves more fully and also introduce the panel. So thank you and over to you, Tim and Martha. Thank you very much, uh, Adele, and appreciate the, the welcome and the opportunity to spend time this evening with all of you. and and our guest panelists. Um, first of all, as, as I um, introduce myself again, is my name is Tim Hackhorn. I am Mohawk uh, from Grand River, Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, I have been an urban Indigenous person all my life and for the most part. And, and so today I come to you as, as in the role of being the Indigenous Vocational Minister supporting um, the ministry formation of of our Indigenous leaders within the church. And, and as well as part of that role, I'm actually within um, the Indigenous office vocation within the office vocation, um, which, and I work very closely with our friends with Indigenous Ministries and Justice and, and bringing that continuity of how we, we work together and support an Indigenous ministry. Um, with that, I also want to um, well, again, welcome everybody. And as we think about tonight, tonight is going to be about a shared learning experience between the Indigenous Churches of the Anglican Church of Canada and the United Church of Canada. We have representatives from both sides, and, and so we are looking for enriching and also in a conversation that's going to broaden our different understandings and our own stories. And, and what that means is being an Indigenous person within the Christian Church. Before I also continue, I also want to take a moment to do to acknowledge the lands and territories from which all of you are represented, all of you are sitting in. Um, I am in Hamilton, and so I, I am on the land and the territory in which my people have always been. But we also share this land with the Anishinaabe people and other people and other nations who've been part of the the Golden Horseshoe area. And there are many treaties and things that have formed our relations before uh, European arrival and ongoing after European arrival. And so I would I like to encourage you, all of you to take a moment to think about the land in which you are on, the relationship that represents with the land 
and the people uh, and the First Nations that have been guardians and, and caretakers of that land for generations in the past. In this today, we are also um, going to have um, a conversation that has moved us in a direction of sort of not only understanding our history, but all, and in which we talked about in, in terms of resilience um, and and making it our way through the harms of the past, but we also are going to talk about self, our understanding of what self determination is. And then we're also going to have a bit of a chat about our dreams of moving forward, what that means moving forward together as a church, as an ecumenical church. And so this is a really important conversation in more ways than one, which is why we're asking everyone to, to hold the questions until we get through and so you can hear the whole story, so that you can hear the wisdom and the thoughts that are being offered by our panelists who have uh, a deep history in more ways than one about what this means. And so... With that, I'm going to introduce our, our friends from the Anglican Church who are present, and then I'll be handing over to Martha, uh, my colleague, who will then introduce herself and what that means, uh, and then uh, our United Church friends. Um, as we go along, we will be putting the questions up on the screen so that you can um, read them as we present them, and they will be in the chat, um, posted in the chat, so you can read those questions, and as you listen to the doc dialogue that happens uh, as we move along. And so with that, um, um, the first person I'm going to introduce is, is our friend um, Rosalind, um, oh, I just did this, um, Ganla Dun Elm, or Rosalind Elm, I got it right. All right. <laughs> she is the Archdeacon from the Oneida First Nation, from Oneida First Nation, and has deep roots in the Aboriginal uh, Anglican in Christian life. After serving as an assistant curate at St. Paul Cathedral in London, she became part-time chaplain at Western University, University College. In 2017, she was inducted as priest in charge of the parish of Six Nations and installed as the chaplain of Her Majesty's Royal Chapel of the Mohawks in Brantford. Yay, my old stopping grounds. Ross is the first Polishoni priest to take charge of the Chapel Royal in Canada. And in 2020, she was appointed Archdeacon in charge of Truth and Reconciliation Initiatives and Indigenous Ministries in the Diocese of Huron. She is also the priest in residence at Huron University College and serves as priest and pastor. Thank you, Rosalind. Our next guest is Vincent Solomon. Vincent likes to be in nature and listen to God and be part of the cathedral praise that is in creation. He is Cree from Norway House, Cree Nation, and, proud, and was proud of his place on earth to be a Cree man. He is a husband and a father. He currently, currently Vince works as the Urban Indigenous Ministry Developer for the Diocese of Rupert's Land and Priest of the Epiphany Indigenous Anglican Church. He has worked for the Mennonite Central Committee as coordinator of the Indigenous Neighbors Program and as Aboriginal Liaison and Culture Teacher for St. James and the Shnabiyoa School Division. I hope I said that right. The Shnabi friends will correct me. Um, <laughs> he co-taught a class in the Indigenous History within Canada and the Anglican Church at St. John's College. He's been a speaker at many organizations as the National Conference of Quakers, Mennonite Church of Canada Conference, and Canada Conference Diocese of Athabasca Synod, and the Healing Conference of Musini, and which are just a few of the things he's been at. He guest lectures at the Menno Simmons College Vineyard School of Justice and is currently a sectional teacher at the Canadian University. And as you can tell, Vincent loves working and will probably die doing his job. <laughs> and to that, I will hand it to Martha. Hi, everyone. Sorry, it took me a while to get my mouse moving. Thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you, Adele and Tim, for the introductions. My name is Martha Padonaquit, and I am Ojibwe Potawatomi from the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Territory on the Bruce Peninsula. 
My first nation is Neoshingaming, which is Cape Croker, Chippewas of Nawash. I currently work for the United Church of Canada in the Indigenous Ministries and Justice Unit as a Community Capacity Development Coordinator for Eastern Canada. It is my pleasure to introduce our panelists, representative of the United Church, the first being Lee Claus. Lee is presently a director of Nations Uniting and an appointed member of the National Indigenous Council for the United Church of Canada. For the remainder of the time, Lee is trying to be retired and is enjoying the pastime as a jack of all trades, like someone before him, chiefly a carpenter. Lee answered the call to enter ministry much later on in life. His challenge specifically was to be in First Nations ministry to assist in some small way in the healing of First Nations, to bridge between cultures and to learn more about his own heritage as a Haudenosaunee. Lee graduated from the Francis Sandy Theological Center and was ordained in the United Church of Canada in 2001. He served the New Credit Chapel of the Delaware pastoral charge from the beginning of studies in 1997 until retirement in December of 2003. In another life, in another time, Lee was a graphic artist, printer, business owner, and member of the Binkley United Church in Hamilton for over 30 years. Lee is married to Julia and they have three children, six grandchildren, four grand dogs, and two grand cats. Lee knows that on his faith journey, he is very happy, and he knows that he is living a life of salvation right now. Thank you, Lee. And secondly, we have Teresa Burnett Cole. The Reverend Dr. Teresa Burnett Cole is the coordinating minister at Glebe St. James United Church in Ottawa. Her academic training is in the area of music, and she plays the percussion. Her training also includes Canadian history and theology. She is a liturgist by training and passion. She regularly teaches on Indigenous issues and worship. Teresa lives with one foot in the Indigenous world. She is Mohawk and the other in the settler world. She has served United Church congregations in the Maritimes, Saskatchewan, Toronto, and Ottawa. She is a visual artist and musician. Teresa has been married to her partner, Ruth, for 28 years, and they love camping, kayaking, and walking the dog together. Thank you, Teresa. And now we'll go into the questions. Just get out of here. The first question is to the United Church team. The resilience of Indigenous peoples within the Christian Church has been a long and difficult journey over the decades. Acknowledging the uniqueness of different experiences across Turtle Island, in which there has been harm to First Nations in varying degrees, Indigenous people have had to carve space for themselves. Please highlight the struggles of Indigenous people within your church and how they have emerged into the modern church community. And I'll leave you to decide who's going to go first. My elder, of course. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, first, right. <laughs> first of all, I want to say welcome to all the people across Canada joining us. It's really fantastic that you would be here with us. I don't know why I became it. Well, I do know why. Uh, first of all, as I read the advertisement for this, it, it mentioned the leaders of the United Church in Aboriginal ministry. And uh, that means that I'm an expert. Those of you who don't know the meaning of expert is X stands for quantity unknown. And spurt is a drip under pressure. So having said that sad joke, one of the... Um, one of the first sets of sessions that I received at uh, the Francis Sandy uh, Center at uh, Paris, Ontario, was a gathering of uh, ministers, uh, both Anglican and United, as well as students. 
and I can remember this one story. Maybe it sounds familiar to you, or maybe it doesn't. But the story is that uh, pre-contact, when tribes or, or bands of people met, they would sit around a sacred fire and they would talk together, they would share, and they would tell their stories of origin. And that was a wonderful time because then other people knew where other people came from and, and what was really important to them. And so I understand that uh, it was a time of good sharing and a time of excellent listening. One day the newcomers came and they uh, sat down, they, they took a place, invited uh, to sit down and take a place to listen. And so they listened to the stories and they were, they were impressed. But when uh, it came to their time, uh, one of the ministers, one of the visitors held up this little book here, the Bible, the Holy Bible, and said, I appreciate what you've told us, but the truth is in here. This is the real truth, and we have it written down. Your stories are all just stories. Some of us may know what that means, but uh, I think that uh, a lot of uh, people uh, may not understand that, that uh, we as Christians uh, really hold the, uh, the story of the Bible very, very sacredly to ourselves and yet don't understand, nor do they hear uh, other creation stories, other stories of uh, uh, particularly for, for the Mohawk people, uh, the woman falling from the sky and, and uh, landing on turtle's back, or the uh, story that I know, I think I know about the uh, uh, Ojibwe that talks about the creator blowing through a conch shell. So there's many stories of creation, and all of them are truth filled. And so when I tell that story to people in the church that I attend, which is not a, a not on reserve, nor is it um, uh, nor is it Aboriginal, they learn new things, and I think that's a, the big thing is is that uh, uh, I think our sharing of our stories becomes really really important to us, but where I see the problems is. We as Native people are bearing the story of shame and bearing the story of uh, um, ignorance and bearing the story of not knowing. And we carry that like a great cloak on our, our shoulders. And those who know the Bible know their truth and use it to sort of, well, hit us over the head. So that, that's part of the, the part of the, the danger that, that I think that happens in some of our churches today. And of course, there are other things that also happen as well. So I've found my ministry while being important to Six Nations and being important to Chapel of the T Delaware and the New Credit, uh, Mississaugas of the New Credit, uh, my ministry also was to other church ministries, other church ministers, and uh, teaching them about Aboriginal thing, uh, things. It's a kind of a, uh, a long, long road. And certainly I think that I've had a, a enough, uh, enough of my teaching to carry through. Now, in my story, my story of life, uh, I was raised as a non-Native person. My father told me never to talk about the fact that I was Native. I don't blame him for that. It did make life easier, but when I was younger, I was a fighter. And as a fighter, uh, when I was bigger than the other people, I won fights. When I was smaller than the other people, I got my clock cleaned. And so I, I learned a whole lot to uh, 
to understand and live in a non-native society as a native person. But I didn't know why. My challenge to go into ministry was to find out who I was. And that's another 45 minute story. So nobody's going to hear that tonight. But as I said uh, in, uh, in my understanding, I am living a life of, uh, of salvation. And certainly it's a very good thing that I like. I'm, I'm impressed. And whether it made any difference in life, I don't know. But uh, I'm changing the church. And it's taken 500 years for us to get this badly messed up by Columbus, who was lost. Uh, and it's going to take us another 500 years to refine ourselves. So I'm one of the sowers out in the field sowing seeds. Thank you, Lee. Teresa. Teresa. Well, that's a good segue, Lee. My my name, Teresa, means reaper. Um, so I'm out there harvesting. Um, I, I, the first thing I thought of when uh, I um, looked at this question around resilience is, I mean, what do we even mean when we're talking about resilience? And uh, the idea that it's the capacity to uh, withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. And the, I love it that the, the dictionary uh, says it's toughness. And I think, yeah, that's partially true. Uh, it's also the ability to spring back into shape. And um, our people have had to do that um, time and time and time again. And I was thinking a little bit about um, the challenges of uh, Indigenous people sort of in the in the modern period or uh, post residential schools and I really got to thinking about the state of emergency that's been declared in so many of our communities um, and that that's it's an epidemic of death uh, an epidemic by suicide an epidemic uh, by addictive or what I think of as numbing behaviors um, that are a direct result of the racist government policies and residential school system that our communities have had to live through. And um, I don't know of a Native person who hasn't been affected by that system, even if they never went themselves. Um, scripture tells us, um, you know, Jesus said a bruised reed, um, he will not break. And I got thinking about that a lot because I thought that's the essence, the essence of resilience. It's um, being able to spring back to who your original instructions, who you originally are. Um, and when I think about that, uh, at least within our um, uh, United Church uh, framework, I think of uh, the work that's being done by... Um, the funding programs we have, one of which is the Healing Fund. And what I love about those programs is they're programs for healing. They're programs for communities. Uh, it's broader than churches. And um, they're doing things to help strengthen that resilience, things like language programs, because um, we know so much of our um, of who we are is embedded in those languages and doesn't translate well. And um, one one of those examples um, that's been a, a community partnership recently is the um, uh, the publication of the Mohawk Bible, um, and the dedication of uh, a group of elders, elder women, um, who um, helped the translator through, and he did something like. 57 of the 65 books himself picking up uh, from uh, an ancestor who had done the the gospels and I think that's um, a brilliant way that the church could be involved not in um, doing the translation but in providing the circumstances to help that along the other thing uh, I was thinking about was uh, this past summer we had the, the latest version of the National Indigenous uh, 
spiritual gathering. And uh, it was really interesting to see sort of what the um, the choices of workshops were. Um, they had workshops on racism and looking at the um, connections between Black and Indigenous forms of racism. Our friend Adele uh, led that one. Um, naloxone training, so that, and, and a number of those spaces were reserved for um, Indigenous youth that were at the event. Um, so getting that information and, and that equipment into the hands of the people who really need it. Um, there was a panel discussion with youth where the rest of us sat silent and allowed the youth to talk about what's really concerning them. I mean, they're the leaders, they're the church of tomorrow. Um, and nobody talked about music in the church. Nobody talked about changes in, in worship style. It was much more substantive and much closer to the bone. You know, we also heard from ministers uh, who talked about their exhaustion um, at the endless cycle of funerals and the endless cycle of um, real tragedy that drains their um, spiritual batteries, if you will. Um, and they also talked about the fact that um, being residential school survivors themselves, which a number of them are, um, they really hadn't had an opportunity to do their healing work. Uh, and we heard from the general secretary some promises about getting some help out there. And um, I'm going to hold him to it. I'll be one of the ones that says, but you said, um, because I think those things are important. And Lee, where's my camera? There it is. I got my sacred fire going, buddy. Thank you, Teresa. Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Actually, I was gonna, yeah, thank you. And um, I'll just give it an opportunity to Rosalyn, if you wanna go ahead and answer and then right to Vincent. Uh, it's, it's good to be here with all of you. Um, I guess for me, I mean, uh, um, coming from the Anglican tradition, um, our my family has a deep, deep, Anglican strand going through them as well as a deep, deep traditional strand going through them as well. Um, my mother was raised to be a hereditary title holder in the Bear Clan. So she was strictly traditional. Um, our family on, on my mother's side was strictly traditional. Um, but she met my father who was both uh, traditional and Anglican. And back in those days, they, as they say, you could be both. You could, you know, and it's often said that um, people would say, oh, well, we have to wait for the Anglicans to get out of church before we can start this. So they got to, and then of course the Anglicans would tell the priest, we have to be out before, before 11 o'clock because we have to go to ceremony. Back in the day, this is how it was. And back in the day, we've had traditional title holders that knew scripture just as well as the priest because they had to they had to know because they were leaders of the community spiritual leaders um smoke johnson uh was a was one of those traditional leaders in our community at six nations um who was uh who would read scripture uh in the church yet he was a very traditional um person um, even in our community of Oneida, we've had traditional people who, who again, were faith keepers, who that was their job to ensure that the church bell was ringing every Sunday and so on and so forth. So, so you know, my mother, my grandparents, you know, talk of those days when um, when we were very, we were a spiritual people who, who received a revelation, not a conversion, because we don't believe in conversion. But a revelation through scripture, through teachings um, that just coincided with our teachings of the peacemaker, the teachings of um, of um, of our sacred story of, of of again Sky Woman falling as as you said as you said Lee, yes those were very much a big part of of our spiritual um, um, 
personhood. So for me, it was it was not a hard thing to to think of of where my life would where my life's calling would be. Uh, of course, you know, like most young people, I, you know, had my run-ins with this and that. The other thing, I was a, I was a fighter too. I like to throw the occasional lunchbox here and there. Um, <laughs> but in the end of the day, you know, I think we find we find our calling, uh, and our ancestors certainly, I think, tap us on the shoulder to say this is this is where you need to be. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I certainly stand on the shoulders of of my elders, both my traditional elders and my um, my Anglican elders or my Christian elders as well. Um, and I had a hard time in seminary. Uh, I went to uh, University of Western Ontario and then Huron College uh, for seminary. A very hard time of of how I was going to reconcile who I was. Um, as as certainly a traditional person or someone who who followed the traditional way, yet also followed the 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 Christian way as well. How was that going to play out? How was I going to to articulate um, my faith, not only to uh, my colleagues but also to my people, who uh, in their own right, you know, after after um, you know these big these big events of of Oka. And of course, the residential school um, event. Um, who my my grandparents were were survivors of residential school of the Mohawk Institute and of and of the um, Mount Elgin uh, residential school. So, how was that all going to be? How was that all going to translate? And I and I struggled a lot um, in seminary about how that was going to look, and. Um, but it was it was when I say I struggle, it was a good struggle. It was certainly something that that really formed who um, I was going to be, who I was becoming. Um, I was so grateful to all of the um, Leo. His name's Leo Elijah. He was he's a Bear Clan faith keeper. Who I said I don't know if I should be doing this. I just feel like I I'm I'm not supposed to do this. But and you know at the same time I turn here and I'm and I'm called to it and. He knew a lot of the ceremonies and a lot of, you know, he had so much wisdom to give. And um, he said, you two will be a faith keeper and faith keepers need to learn how to walk in both ways. Faith keepers need to, you know, um, be be um, um, aware of, of the environment that we're living in. And I look back on that now at this um, diminutive um, indigenous guy you know, but he had so much wisdom to give and he wasn't shy about, you know, all of the hardship that he'd been through in his life and the the metanoia that he had, you know, as an indigenous traditional man who struggled with uh, colonialism in his own way and suffered from from those kinds of loss of loss of um, I'll say loss of warriorhood. Because I think a lot of our indigenous men it, struggle with with um, manhood um, in this in this era, and it leads to all kinds of things. So I think it's really important to support indigenous men. Just just saying, just to say that as something that I'm I'm continuing to learn and realize of my hope that I have for my indigenous brothers. Um. So it it has been it's been uh, it's been. A struggle but it's been a good struggle and one of the things that i realized is the becoming the becoming of uh, a spiritual person the becoming of someone who is walking that road and on a trajectory of of healing and walking with my people on that on that road and for us we have a wealth of of history um, the indigenous, I, I should say that the uh, Ganyange and, and the Mohawk heritage within the Anglican church is strong. Obviously, we have we have the second oldest Protestant church uh, in Canada, you know, in our in, in our on our territory with the Mohawk chapel. Just the the um, the philosophical um, and theological 
intelligence and articulation that they had to make sense of these two things coming together. The, the understanding of ritual and protocol was so deep within our traditional people, our, our Mohawk people, our Six Nations people, that they were able to understand what was happening, what, what Eucharist and the sacraments were about, and, uh, and, 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 and look at them in, with the lens of looking at the way that we use our medicines the way we use tobacco, the way we the way we use a uh, 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 story, and the way that that we use ritual and protocol to ensure that that there is a separation between that so called sacred and profane, and kind of bringing it into our world. Um, it's just it's when you think of our when you think of our people um, going to going to England and meeting with um, Queen Anne to talk about the importance of, of stewardship of our lands, our lands that we both shared, our lands that were coming under the auspices of the Turo. Um, just that, just to be in that conversation, how, how proud I think our people would be now to see that articulation of the Turo, that articulation of our of our um, spiritual narratives, that articulation of 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 ceremonies like condolence, for instance. Um, this is the, these are the shoulders definitely that I stand on that give me strength um, to say that you know we are spiritual people and we and we all uh, as spiritual people have different ways of articulating of articulating that spirituality. Um, so. It's it's certainly it's certainly um, I am of course a work in progress. I'm constantly learning, and that's where I want to be. And um, my mother, who is uh, who is a, a language teacher and a consultant, you know, you know, when sometimes things don't go out my way, she says, "Look at me." She says, "I'm always learning. There's always opportunities to, to learn," and so that must be, that's the thing that we must we must look to. Is is not is not to be um, 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 reaching a pinnacle tomorrow or the next week, but to always be learning, always be walking that path, always be walking towards. And so, if I could be half the person my mother is, I would be doing well. But um, but I'm working towards that. And so, I guess I'm gonna end, end there. Um, and I hand it over to um, my brother Vincent, um, who is. Uh, just a, just a lovely individual, lots of stories to share too. It's good to see you, Vincent. Good to see you too. <laughs> um, well, um, one of the things that I think <clears throat> uh, about, when I think about um, what it is that, um, that indigenous people have struggled with, and I'm, I'm talking more so Winnipeg as well as uh, Manitoba, um, it, it is this whole pain issue, right? Well, it's not an issue. It, is, it seems to be a very much, a, you know, very much permeated the life of Indigenous people here. And, and, and we've had issues of suicide, of, you know, uh, dealing with, with racism, um, residential schools, you know, those kinds of painful, painful things that have gone on within the life of Indigenous peoples here. And, um, and I, I think especially um, uh, with the ones who move into the city and, and like more specifically here in Winnipeg, um, a lot of people have come from that situation where um, they are residential school survivors or they are, you know, living with the residual effects of those residential schools, right? And so um, it seems like we're constantly having to deal with a lot of that kind of stuff, at least within the ministry that, that, that I'm in. And um, so they've come from those kinds of struggles. And we talk about the resiliency of Indigenous people, and, and I find that very, very amazing that, um, and I guess for my own life as well, that that um, Native people can actually still forgive 
right? That indigenous people can say, I forgive you and, and let go. Many, many, many indigenous people have done that over the years, not only to other people or to those people that have harmed them, but also to the church. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, like, how does someone forgive an institution? You know, how does someone do that? And yet indigenous people have done that um, over the years. And one of the one of the things is that many many indigenous people still to this day um, go to church and still believe um, in uh, the gospel message that the church brings. And um, so, so I find that I find that very very amazing that 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 can be done. Um, in Winnipeg. <clears throat> There is there is a lot of struggle with with racism, which continues to this very day. I remember when I first moved here in 1986, and um, I was at university, and living in one of the residences, and and having an X being put on my door, um, because only because I was native and nobody nobody would talk to me, and so this was my undergrad time before I moved into uh, theology. And, and so um, I spend that first year having to deal with that. And, and that's what people here in Winnipeg deal with on a constant basis, is that whole issue of um, that your skin color is important, far more important than who you are as an individual, right? And, and that you are judged by the tone of your, your skin color. And, and so that, that still continues uh, to be very much of a struggle within the Indigenous community here in Winnipeg. Not only that, but it's also more and more so, and I think this is, this is happening co- uh, with, across Canada as well. And not just with Indigenous people, but um, it seems to be with Indigenous people more so, is, is, is that this need for, for housing and for... Um, uh, for food, food and security is very much a big part of the, the ministry that we have and deal with, um, with within our own community. And, and so um, that has been something that has been very much a struggle for Indigenous people as well. Um, there, there has been another thing is that, <laughs> like, what do you do with the sacred teachings that we have, right? What do you do with being Indigenous and Christian at the same time? And, and there seems to be sometimes a, um, a separation between the two. This is who I am in church, right? But this is who I am in ceremony. And the two are basically different. And, and so there, there, there are those questions here. And, and so <clears throat> um, I, I think Winnipeg is a bit diff- very, very much different in that those are the questions, kinds of questions that we are exploring here in this city. How can you be a Christian and native at the same time? And, and so we're, we're dealing with those things. We're dealing with those things in the church. And, and, um, and, and it has been... Um, a challenge for some. Personally, I don't think that there really is that much of a big deal about it, Um, only because I have experienced that I do not walk in two roads, right? I walk in one road, where the two are the same thing very often. And that when I look into scripture, not only do I see my brown skin, but I also see my traditions, my, my values, my teachings, uh, very much a part of um, the, the, the way in which scripture speaks to me sometimes. And um, I mean, I allow God to speak to me and, and um, the way that God wants to. Um, but sometimes he says, hey, look, look at this. This is being native, right? And I remember the very first time when I did when I was at a ceremony and I thought to myself, oh, my God, you know, I've done something bad. This is not good. 
and and I was I was just apologizing and repenting profusely in my backyard. And and as you know, you know the only way that, that Christian know that we that we can hear God in our own hearts. Um, God was speaking and saying, "Well, when did I ever ask you to be not to be not indigenous, right? When did I ever ask you to give up being Cree, to give up being who you are, and who I've made you to be?" And so this is what has started me off um, into being the person that I was born to be. And my introduction that said, you know, Vince is very proud that he was put on this earth to be a Cree man. And, and so that is um, the way my journey began with Indigenous people, uh, sorry, with my own indigeneity. And, and I think it kind of <laughs> um, was a deconstruction for me. Um, and in a lot of ways, it has been used by God to be able to speak and to help other people within within um, within this territory um, that we're in, as well as all across Canada, because I've been doing some some teaching as well all over the place. So like being who you are, that there is a reason why I was born to be Cree. There is a reason why I was born to be male. There is a reason why I was put on this earth to learn to understand. Um, there was a reason why okay. my elders chose to teach me the teachings that they did. And, and there's a reason why my elders now say, go and do your work and go and teach. Because you, you, you are, you are, you carry, you know, the, um, the knowledge of our people. And, and so, part of that work has involved working within the church and and saying to the church you know listen and learn stop just stop and listen and learn and and so epiphany indigenous anglican church is a place for where um, people can come for healing it is a place where uh, indigenous um, ceremony is celebrated, where indigeneity is part of the look of the church, where indigenous symbols are part of our worship time. And we meet in a circle rather than in pews, you know, looking at the back of, of other people's heads kind of thing. And, um, and, and it's a wonderful way in which to be able to become community, sitting together in a circle and learning that once again, hey, listen, this is what our community is. We're relearning within the indigenous church to be a community once again, right? Because we've been told for so many times to, to not be a community. I mean, the Indian Act at one point, that if only, if two people, if there were more than two people talking together in public, that they, that, that needed to be stopped, right? And, and so getting back once again, those things which we have lost and the pride that we once had as indigenous people. And, and so that, that's um, one of the things in which the struggles in which we are emerging from, and now we are emerging into uh, the, the, the way the church is for us now. So we're becoming a very sovereign place where our liturgy is different our music is different we have the drum and we we um we have welcome songs we have uh all kinds of, all kinds of stuff like that so it's very it's a very um good place to be for for a lot of people um yeah i think that's basically where i'll stop thanks vincent and um, so that was just the first question. <laughs> and and um, we are so nowhere near our, our original time. So um, what I, uh, we're going to do is I'm going to ask the next question around. It's around Ben. Um, the, for the next question, I'm going to ask the folks if we can sort of um, try and um, keep the timing in. We, we have a 
approximately about 40 minutes left in total. So if we can get through a couple of questions in the Q&A at the end, that'd be amazing. Um, but having said that, um, let me just quickly share on the screen and what the next question is, and, and I'll start reading it as Zoom takes its time to, to get it up. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Indigenous Identity Church, so the understanding of self-determination has been embraced by both denominations through the adoption of UNDRIP. Also within our, the Indigenous Church of of our respected denominations, Indigenous leaders and elders have provided pathways as is described in the caretaker's report for the United Church and our way of life in the Anglican Church of Canada. Now for, for those who, for our participants today, we are going to be um, putting those links available for you to go and read those documents on your own. So this is a bit of an informed part of the discussion. So the question here for our group, and you've already begun answering some of it, so maybe just build um, in more specific examples and ways you see this, this is in our relationship with the church, what does self-determination look like and how does it acknowledge the complexity of indigenous identity, spirituality, and relationships? I mean, it's a big question. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll keep it pretty broad as we can, much as we can. Um, and at the same time is, you know, we're trying to I know it's a it's a big question <laughs> so with that I'm gonna actually ask um our Anglican friends to start first and um and we'll go from there so hey. Vincent and then we'll pick on Ross okay Vincent here we go <laughs> um <clears throat> well that is one huge, <laughs> huge thing, one huge topic that um, I, I think I can spend more than 40 minutes talking about. Well, at least try anyway, right? But um, I don't think that, that I won't do that. So um, I, I think part, part of um, what, what is self-determination for us is we have a document now that is part of the Indigenous Church called Sacred Circle. And the covenant um, that was written many, many years ago, but also the recent one, Our Way of Life. And Our Way of Life was, was something that I've, been very, that I've been very proud of being a part of. I was one of the um, people that helped to forge the, um, the documents. So, and, and I think in there, <clears throat> mostly we talk about Indigenous de self-determination as the ones that are in charge. You know, that we are... Um, have been, to put it bluntly, which the document doesn't, but <laughs> puts it in a very more nicer, nicer way, is that we are sick and tired of being told what to do, you know, and, and not being listened to by the Anakin Church. And so it is time that the Indigenous Church articulates what self-determination is and, and who we are as Indigenous people within that meaning of that. And um, what is what does the emergence of the modern uh, in, uh, modern indigenous church look like, and and what is community with it, right? And how does community connect to it, and our connection to nature, um, the earth, and and to one another is very much a part of the document, and and so um, it talks about being strong, autonomous, autonomous spiritually. Uh, that we need to have go back to a sense of community, um, to our a, a sense of our cultural identity, who we are as Indigenous people, what we believe in, and and um, what it is that that God is calling us into. Um, that um, <clears throat> that we chose to be, belong to uh, a church rather than to be baptized into it, um, more so, that is, um, but to have um, the ability to say, no, you're not going, going to impose your church on us. We are going to choose whether or not this is what we want. And, and um, yeah, so it's, it's part of revitalizing our traditional Indigenous practices as well. One of the things that uh, Martin Brokenleg said that we've kept 
as we were <clears throat> writing the document, he said, you know, that what we're trying to do was an almost impossible task. And so my heart just fell going, oh my gosh, he is absolutely right. It is an almost impossible task. And what he said to us at that time was, the slogan way to remember this is, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. And, and so that, that was a part of, um, we're talking about um, what does it mean when we are doing a new thing, right? Because that's what this is. It's God's movement. It is a spiritual movement. It's not a political statement, but rather it is a, a, a spiritual movement, this self-determination. And, um, and what is it that, what new thing is God doing? Um, and um, and what does it mean to be um, the, the the people that is helping God to to form and to shape this new thing? Okay, hey, Roslyn. Thank you, thank you, Vincent. Roslyn, yes. <clears throat> and uh, just to unmute your mic and. Um, <laughs> so we all can hear you. Thank God. Um, I was hoping Vince would go first and talk, and I wouldn't have enough room. So, because it's it's such a big it's such a big issue in terms of it's we 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 are we are on this long road, right? Um, and I think a lot of um, we might see it. We might see different nuances here and in, in there. Um, I just want to talk a little bit, I guess, you know, where I see it. And it's, and it's really quite simple. And I don't want to take too much. I don't want to take too much time. But I always look at this idea of self-determination as looking at either positive freedom or negative freedom. Right. So and I think that it's a it's a it's a good conversation, at least for me to think about this, because, you know, our our our. Um, you know, our belief is is um, service is perfect freedom, right? We say that in our in our BCP, uh, in our prayer book. And I don't ever want to talk of. I don't ever want to say, well, um, you know, free, this kind of self determination allows us to, you know, um, retreat from the polity of the church and be apart from. Um, our, our our Christian brothers and sisters, right? We don't want to create a schism between the indigenous and non-indigenous church. So when I say, well, it's, it is kind of a it's it's a kind of a positive freedom where we can if we can freely ex, we can freely express in our own ways the same ways that you freely express in in your ways. Um, so it's always kind of a, a for us for you know how I articulate it is always a two row path. In which we are we are traveling along this this um, a continuum together, um, and those of uh, my Kanyangi uh, brothers and sisters will know that when you have the two row wampum and you're holding it in front of you, you see it as just two rows. But when you look at it this way, you see though how the how the rows converge right in the fullness of time. So it's it's a very eschatological document, right? So I think for us. When I think of self determination, it's it's always un, we're, we're we're going to to toward a fullness of understanding of of where our destinies are and where they, our destinies lie together. So, um, whereas I as an indigenous person, I want my indigenous brothers and sisters to um, articulate from their ways of becoming and their ways of knowing and being what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, on the other side, I want to walk with, um, I want to walk with the church, the, the broader church in that way as well. And I think for me, um, self-determination has to be understood by both ourselves as indigenous people, but also what that means for the non-indigenous church too. Not to say that they get to, again, you know, they don't get to decide for us who we are, but certainly They'll have to. They'll have to be at some point join the circle. I just one thing that I think I want. I want to um, close out with. Uh, when I was in New Zealand, um, I was um, with Bishop Chris, 
uh, we were sitting in the governance section of, of, of our talk and there was a group of, of bishops, uh, indigenous bishops uh, from, from Oceana. And of course, the diocesan lawyers were sitting on the side in their very nice blue navy suits and their pink in their pink shirts and they're very very right very very proper and uh, they weren't saying anything they knew they couldn't say anything in front of and with, with these uh, indigenous bishops but so the bishops were talking about you know how, you know how this looks in their various contexts and and how we could kind of bring ourselves together that even though we were you know we were we were diverse but we still held we still held to our indigeneity um, as a group mm -hmm. and uh, how we would, this is about creating um, uh, what they called um, a fono, which is a family. Um, so they were talking about the fono and the family and everybody was like so on board with it. And the lawyers were listening and one of them got up and he says, I know that I'm not supposed to speak because it's not my place to speak, but um, as we come, to, as as you close down your your the conversation for for this session, I just want to say that you should know that what you're talking about is so important to our church. The way that you're talking about fono, the way that you're talking about family, the way you're talking about coming together is so important for our church. Because while the Western Church kills itself with individualism, the way that you speak draws us back together again. And this can only come from this group here. And honestly, I was blown away by that. I was blown away by that because um, here's someone who, who should only recognize canon law, only recognize what it means to keep the status quo alive, what it means to keep certain um, certain privileges within one area was well, they were they were on board and saying this to uh, our indigenous leaders, our indigenous elders who were who were speaking of of, of creating um, networks and and working together despite our distance, despite our diversity. So I think that when I when I remember that, I think that all of our you know the United Church, the Anglican Church, the Lutheran Church, you know, this is a walk that we're doing together. Um, and this is a walk that we're doing together with our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters, our our Pakia, as they call it in New Ze as they would be called in New Zealand. Um, and we are moving from idea of being settler church to sojourner church, where we are walking together. So this is this is what I what I'm certainly what what I think we're we're trying to discuss, and and I think it's going to be a fulsome discussion that is cannot be in. 40 minutes, but you all know that. So that's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll go to the United Church team. So, okay, I'll start this time. Um, one thing that people don't seem to understand in the church is my family has been Christian for generations. This is our traditional spirituality. Um, and I've been blessed to have opportunities to walk with um, folks who walk the road of ceremony uh, as well. But I'm really clear that that is not um, a freedom or an opportunity that my father had. And um, what I see in him now is an incredible longing for those things and uh, a real thirst to know um, and to understand. When I thought about self-determination, I thought, oh God, here we go again. Um, and in the United Church of Canada, we've been um, fighting for self-determination uh, since actually before union happened. Um, when church union uh the Methodists, Presbyterians, and Cong Congregationalists came together to form the United Church. Um, the Indigenous churches were considered missions, and therefore uh, we didn't have a voice at the table. And literally, we became United Church churches um, without consultation by the stroke of a pen. So union happened to us. Um, it's not something we had agency in. And we've been fighting for self-determination in this institution ever since. And uh, 
when I sit with um, elders, I hear stories of like years and years of consultations and um, ecumenical uh, Christian conferences and fighting to figure out a way uh, to do it in in our church structure. Um, and after years uh, of consultation, they finally achieved in uh, 1980 the uh, All Native Circle Conference, and that was a huge thing. It was a non-geographic conference which ran um, the way Indigenous people thought it should. Um, and then we evolved in, in the United Church, and the United Church again made a change in its organization. And we went to regions, and literally by the stroke of a pen, um, the All Native Circle Conference uh, was eliminated. And uh, we were given this thing called the, the National Indigenous Organization, which um, at the time of uh, the uh, the change really didn't have much form to it. And nobody knew how it was going to work. And for a long time, there was a lot of grief. In fact, I think there still is about the loss of those earlier structures that worked so well for so many. Um, so now we've got this uh i i try to describe it as a sort of a region on steroids it's more than uh what we call a diocese or a conference it encompasses the whole country um and it has some of the rights of regions like we can ordain people you know we can do that kind of work ourselves um but we're still constantly evolving and you know in in uh was it 2019 or 2017? I can't remember. Um, we put out um, a caretaker's report that was after a long, long set of consultations. And what the calls really say is, we will say who we are. We will say what Indigenous ministry is. We will tell you um, when someone is ready to be um, a, a clergy in our churches we will do it and we will do it in the way that's appropriate to us that is still constantly evolving in the the three terms that i've been involved with the national indigenous uh, council um, we have shifted and changed each time how people get represented we found that elections didn't work for us it wasn't part of our um, way of doing things uh, so we switched to um regions and uh, regional circles in the various areas who then looked at the people and said, these are the people that we need to go and represent us. It was a very different way of, of doing things. And um, we're still trying to figure out what's going to come next. And we're having our first meeting uh, later in this week, and we're going to sort of wrestle yet again with uh, how to address the complexity from across the country. We also um, appointed a, a, a national elders council, which again is not elected. It's it's recognized by the communities, um, those who will be elders and who will speak. And the fascinating thing is um, those elders are defining what that's going to look like um, year by year. And uh, it's very interesting because um, a number of uh, communities in the church uh, want the um, attention of the elders, including the general council executive, who uh, really feels that it's important that um, that, that happen. I, I serve, for good or ill, as the indigenous representative on the um, general council executive. And when I agreed to do it, I said, listen, what we've got to do, um, you know, in the, the two terms I'm going to have is we got to figure out a way to get me out of this position. And by in that six year period to have a way for the general council executive and the national elders and the national indigenous council to talk to one another without having one person working as a gatekeeper between them. That's the dream we're working on it. I got two more years. Um, you know. 
So over to you, Lee. Thank you very much. I appreciate your thoughts and your comments. Want to tell you two things. The first, uh, I think most of us are most of us are familiar with the, the two row wampum and our meaning of relationship with native and non native. And the two rows are divided by three white rows as well. A, right, a white row of peace, a white row of understanding and friendship, and a white row of forever. And I understand that the teaching was that the two rows, the two purple rows, should never meet. If they met, there would be calamity. Meet the calamity. <laughs> the reason why I say that is I walk in two worlds. I've lived in two worlds. I'm living in two worlds. One of my worlds is a broken world. The other of my worlds is a broken world. How do, we, how do we resolve this other than to listen to each other and give something up? To not hold on to the absolutes that we have. My church, the non-native church, is just as broken as the native church. And if you didn't hear that very well, stick your finger in your ear and listen to it again. Our non-native church is just as broken as our native church. Hear that. We need to change. And change is happening. The other part of that is it might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen 50 years from now. It might happen 500 years from now. All of us are living on the pathway, on the process towards relationship with Creator God. And I think we're working on that. And I'm going to stop there because I, I'm going to talk too long. I sound like a, a, a reverend. Thank you. Thank you all. So for our last question, I will read it and we will go with the, the Anglican team first. So the question is, so the leading up to the question, the dream of our relationships moving forward together with the church began with our resilience and is established through self-determination. Recognizing the complexity of the harms of the past and the systemic forms of colonization that still are within the church, we are hopeful in the Creator and the work of the Holy Spirit to help us in our healing. So I'm going to ask each of you to name one or two steps towards collaborative spaces within our churches and ecumenically. What are one or two steps? And we'll start with the Anglican team. Thank you. Am I going? Is that what you're telling me, Rosalind? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay. So I know to keep short. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, two things. Um, well, I think the first thing would be the you know to to continue to get to know one another, and um, I, I I don't think um, we as the body of Christ has done a good job of being the body of Christ, right? I think that we have forgotten and we think that the Anakin Church is one body, the United Church is another body, and, and the two function in two different ways, but we don't. I mean, we function, yes, we do have different government structures, but we are the same body. 
and and we have the same Lord. And and so I think that we need to um, recapture that teaching that we do have the same Lord and that we do follow the same Jesus, that we that we walk the same path and, and that we are going to end up in the same place. Right. And, and one of the things that my elders have always said, and one of the, that, and one of the things that they told me when we when I first started <clears throat> um, uh, planting the Indigenous um, Epiphany Indigenous Church in Winnipeg is that you cannot do it without the other members of the church, meaning um, you have to be ecumenical as much as possible. And, and I think um, starting with with getting to know one another, one of the things that we've done at Epiphany is we've just started a ecumenical um, time together where the only thing that we do is just we just come together and we sing. You know, it takes away all of the theological, all of the theological walls that divide us, right, and where we cannot begin to go through, or we cannot even begin to think past in, in getting to know one another. And, and so just the coming together, just to be brothers and sisters in Christ and to, and to worship and love one another and, and, and just to be who we are meant to be one in Christ, in Jesus. And so that I think is one of the more important things. The other thing is that making sure that when we, that, that we try and work together as much as possible because our resources these days, uh, more and more so, um, are, are limited. And, and so working together is, is really good. There are so many things that I have learned from my Presbyterian friends when I've had conversations with them, as well as with the Quakers and the United Church people that I've met over the years, uh, Mennonites and so on and so forth, all of the people that we've had conversations with and, in, and the ones that we are in communion with, of course, the Lutherans and, and um, doing new things together, you know, do just coming together to support one another. Uh, so getting to know one another and supporting one another, I think, are two important things. Thank you. Rosalind? Yes, thank you. And thank you, Vin Vincent, again, for, for going first. Um, I, I, you know, I, I really love to be in this, in this, in this scenario, um, because I get to hear and learn from so many, so many folks out there. So I'm going to just listening to um, Lee and Vincent and 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 um, having all of those ideas percolate as well. Um, the church is broken and walking with and so many good things that are that are, that are percolating. I guess I want to I want to turn um, to look at the idea of. The, the, the thing that the thing one of the things one of the things that we a step to take is 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 to to take a posture um within the hospitality of receiving um how how can we do that and i think that really when i listen to you know the uh, for some reason you muted uh your computer muted you Rosalind. Sorry, right, thank you, thank you. So I think it's that so important to take that posture of of being hospitable uh, and to receive to receive each other. Um, you know, the world changed in October seventh, uh, right? And suddenly it became. I think a lot of us have became aware of this this being glorious perspicuity. This, this, this real uh, confidence in being right, right? Um, we are always in that, we are always living in that flattering conceit um, that, you know, we were taught by the hermeneutic of suspicion, will to power and sexual drive and ownership of production, and all of those wonderful things that, that the enlightenment uh, brought us, big deal, right? And, and so I think that, you know, we we've adopted this posture is that we all that we must get it right and we must be right, um, but but this is not who we are who we are really called to be in the end. We are going to make a lot of we are going to make a lot of mistakes. We are going to misread each other. We're going to um, 
you know, we're not, we're not always going to agree on certain things and so on and so forth. But one of the things that I really recognized at our, one of our sacred circles that we had over COVID was, um, um, it was on, it was on zoom, um, is the, is the, is the range of voices that are now being heard. Um, and I look at the place where I come from here in Southwestern Ontario is that we've had 70 years of, of working towards um, as, 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 as a collective organization within the Diocese of Huron, for instance. And before, and if you take in the long durée of history, we find that we've actually had, you know, two or 300 years of, of, of walking together. And uh, all of that looks, might look different in, in the West, in the North, uh, in the East. And so the multiplicity of, of voices really, really lends us to, to being able to receive receive those ideas and receive that experience as something that 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 formulates um our direction and and where we and where we want to go and where we want to be um so i think that you know uh, that this is this is what i'm this is what i want to echo as i hear as i hear um uh, my colleagues speaking and i and and to um this 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 move away from that uh, christian hauntology right um, to long for this irretrievable past that that the that the settler church has, and mourning its futurity. The reality is is that we as indigenous peoples are bringing a new futurity um, um, into the church. This is this is the gifts that we have to offer to the church in its whole. So, um, I I just I'm I'm just really grateful to to learn from those messages that that uh, my brothers and sisters are giving so i think accepting a posture or, or or being in a posture of receiving uh would be one of the things that is most important as we as we move forward thank you so as, as we go towards our united church friends i just want to highlight that we have a about seven minutes um, left for this particular piece, and um, when you're finished answering this question, um, I will um, we'll we'll, we'll t talk about the next steps. But for now, um, hand it over to Teresa. There you go. Um, so three things to say. I'm going to make it really quick. Um, the question asked about uh, spaces of collaboration. So I have three things uh, I want you to to take away from from this conversation from from my part. First of all, understand that our communities are as diverse and as complicated as yours are. Um, within these communities, we have members who are staunchly church folks who want nothing to do with tradition. We have other people who have voted with their feet and left the church and gone uh, to to seek out their indigenous uh, traditions. And then we have the group that's in between, the group that are trying to walk those two pieces together, like Vincent said, one road. Um, and uh, you need to understand that and that all three of those groups will have different approaches to how they wanna collaborate. Second, I get it that you wanna repair the religion the relationship between us and you. Get it in spades. But you can't repair a relationship you don't have. Um, you need to get to know the neighbors before you can reconcile with them. And when I say that, I'm not saying, um, you know, invite us in to do a workshop. You come to us for a change mm -hmm. and, and learn with us for a while. Um, you'll get far more takers than, oh, can you come do another workshop? Um, finally, last point. Um, I've had the the um, grace to, I'm going to end with a story, um, to be part of a, a task group looking at the language of mission and the, the violence that it has wrought in uh, communities. And we talked about it a lot, but I've, I've, um, one of the Cree elders that was on the task group said, you know, it's nice if you change your language, mission stuff, and, and that's all well and good, but it doesn't help us with the crisis our communities are experiencing right now. 
Uh, that's where we need the church to step up. Uh, we don't want to have nice talks with you. Uh, we need help. And when I say help, don't send us help. Send us the finances and the materials we need to get the job done. Over to you, Lee. Gee, thank you. Thank you for that, Teresa. I appreciate that. Anyway, I, I'm going to try and tell three stories in a hurry. And the stories are, yeah. First of all, the document of discovery, the apology of it by the, the Roman Catholic Church. That is a tremendous thing. And that infects, infects and affects all of our society from the judging, the judges, from the courts, and from the um, uh, from the civil servants, everybody. That's the effect. The story I want to tell you uh, is about a man who who was very very rich. It was a man, and he had lots of money. And he decided he when he died died he did not want to leave that money behind. So he talked to God very seriously and uh, made prayers that maybe he could take a suitcase to, with him to heaven. And creator God said, oh, that's okay. We can do that. But he didn't tell St. Peter. Uh, and uh, the man died. And, and before he died, he, he took all of his gold. He melted it down and he put it into blocks and put it in this big suitcase. And finally, when he was called to go to heaven, uh, he got up to the pretty gates and he uh, struggled with this big thing, and um, he said, I can bring this in, and St. Peter said, oh, no, you can't, well, and he said, yes, I can, God said, and he said, no, no, he can't, you can't bring that in, let me check with God, oh, St. Peter was upset, God said it was okay, tell me, what do you bring into heaven that is so wonderful that you can bring into heaven, and the man lifted the lid, and St. Peter exclaimed, Paving bricks? You brought paving bricks to heaven? Second story. A man, uh, uh, well, maybe it was a woman, who knows. Uh, they were dying, and as they were dying on their deathbed, uh, they talked to the angels that were hovering above them and uh, wanted to know what was in store for them. And... So the angel said, well, we'll take you when you take a look at all, uh, in heaven here and, and see what it's all about. And so they walked into a great big hall and up and down the hall were all kinds of doors. And they'd open one door and there would be native people there dancing and having a powwow. They opened another door and another group of uh, um, Hindus, they were doing some fun and the feasting. And eventually they came to one door and St. Peter well, I guess it was a St. Peter, it was the angel. Be quiet when we pass this door. They're, they are Christians in there, and they think they're the only ones here. I'm going to stop. I, I love the I love the stories. Uh, thank you so much. And um, that um, that was uh, the questions. Believe it or not, there was more questions, but we we succinct it to these three. Um, I just so to acknowledge first of all is that as we're approaching the one minute mark here, I um, want to know from our panel here: Would you be willing to stay on for uh, ten more minutes? Um, that way, if there's some questions from folks and then Martha, if you're able to be able to stay on and do the closing as planned. Um, and then, so yeah, so with that, I just, um, first is thank you so much to all of you for the the wisdom, the knowledge, the the, the different perspectives that, that you've brought forward. Um, and and for the rest of the, the group now, the part the, the participants, if you if there's a question that you want to bring forward, I, I think um, both Martha and I are going to keep an eye on those questions and um, see what comes up. And um, out of the asset, you put them into the chat. When those questions come up, um, we're gonna we're gonna take two or three of them um, and 
and I'll ask a representative from either the Anglican or the and the United Church to to speak to those questions, and we'll just sort of alternate between folks on in that front. Um, recognizing it is um, late for some folks in the East, and well, a little bit early for others still at this time. So, is there any questions? Yes, Rosalind. Oh, you're good. Okay, sorry. Roz, um, so uh, any questions? I've not seen anything pop up so quickly, of course. My, there's, um, uh, oh, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the first question is, how can the church inherited by all of us settlers uh, be held responsible for what was in political in shutting up the indigenous people? I want to say a little bit about that. And pardon me for interrupting, but the reason why they're responsible, why the um, church that's inherited by us uh, settlers are responsible is because we, through our grandfathers, through our fathers, through our mothers, through our grandmothers, through our generations before us, have set up the system such that we benefit from it. It's our benefit, and we live on it. If you worked in a steel company and you uh, made steel, the agreements made to, to buy that uh, property or take that property uh, over to, uh, uh, to mine it was made by... Uh, uh, Apart from, from just saying to people, you are responsible, <laughs> I don't know if there is any other way that we can hold anybody responsible for that, um, at least in a way that, that they would um, actually um, want to live into um, uh, a change uh, systematically within the, within the church. Um, we've tried for years within the Anglican Church of Canada, and we have not succeeded succeeded at all, at least, at least in what in. Uh, but so that's now we we are starting to think about having a, a self determining church. Um, the only thing that I think that we can do really is to um, learn how we can now, uh, even within our brokenness, walk together. And, and how we as fellow Christians, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, can connect with one another and work towards the path that leads us to where we're supposed to be and where we're supposed to be going and where we're going to end up in the end. And um, 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 like, like the other thing too is, I mean, I, I think the Anglican Church in this case forgot that it was that it is a spiritual movement and that it was a spiritual movement that it began as a spiritual movement and became too entangled with the political system and and i think a lot of our churches um, that has what what has happened is that and continues to happen and um, um, as one friend, Mennonite friend of mine said, you, you, you belong to a state church, you know, and I'm going, and well, no, I don't, but, but then after I thought about it, I went, oh my gosh, I do belong to a state church, because that's what it was before, right, entangled within the political system, and, and forgetting that we are, we are a spiritual movement, that the church is a spiritual movement. Thank you. Thank you, and and um, so you know, as I look at it, we probably have time for one more question. Um, I, I see there is a question directed to you specifically, Teresa, around your involvement in, in terms of general counsel and relationship. I, I would like to take that question and broaden it a little bit more, um, and and because one of the th conversations I've been having as well with some folks. Is is understanding some of the systemic issues <laughs> that were within our churches, and 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 they're in subtle ways, you know. And um, for an example, I had a conversation not too long ago about about how pastoral care 
in the way that is done by some of our non-Indigenous leaders is actually very paternalistic and therefore very patronizing towards our Indigenous identity. And so what does that mean in terms of how that's entrenched in church culture and identity in relationship to us? So I, I would broaden this question to be in is what are some of the biggest challenges with church culture versus our identity and how we function as leaders? Sure, no problem. Um, getting at what's under the question, um, my concern is that um, that on an intellectual level, um, this is still business as usual. Um, there's the way our structure is, um, we're not taking seriously the sovereignty of the National Indigenous Council. In this case, that's the form format I work in. Um, and there's still a sense that I'm sent from the General Council Executive to the Indigenous Church, uh, where those two groups need to be in the same room together and having that conversation together. That's my difficulty. Um, it's the power structure that hasn't changed. Um, and and that's the case over and over and over again. You know, I, I, one story, I used to work for um, what was a conference. And um, I had a position in that conference, which is one of responsibility. And when I left and went into an Indigenous ministry, and had to call the office about something that we needed, you'd have thought my my intelligence had dropped by 30 points because the way I was treated was horrendously. And this was even someone that had been a colleague. Um, and there's a sense that um, our indigenous churches are, you know, a leftover from mission and, you know, they're really a very small part of the church and, and who cares anyway? Um, and that's really tough to to dig through that attitude and and i'm grateful for colleagues who um who do stand up and do that hard work and i see some of them are on this call tonight so thank you to you thank you Teresa. and rosalind i'll provide the next opportunity for you um You know, um, one of the things I think that that's really the the kind of irk I just kind of irks at me I guess is kind of is I was I was told one time that um, Raz, you shouldn't hate the church or you sh you know that sort of thing and um, and I and I was very very critical of some of different policies and so on and so forth. And I was told by a, a, a white person in power that you shouldn't hate the church. And, uh, and I nearly lost my collective on this person. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I love her dearly. Don't, don't get me wrong, but it was just, just, it just drove me up the wall. Um, and I just, and I just, and I said, you know, I said, when you admit that you sold out to empire. When will you admit that? It's just, it's real simple. You know, you sold out to empire, just admit it. Admit it and we can we can try and work together and fix it and we can go on. It's because the things, the way that you are going, you are polishing the brass on the Titanic. And of course, you know, all of these things that, that I that I had, had said was partially because it was it was hurtful to it was hurtful to think that because because I'm critical of certain policy or critical of of certain ways of doing things in in the in the quote unquote settler church um, does not mean that I that I will back away from the body of Christ, which is all of us. Um, but I will say that there is this institution that is as Lee has says is broken. Um, so I think we have, we, we have to face, we have to face that. We have to face that idea that, 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 um, 
there is there is a, there is there is there is bits of empire lots of bits of empire in the church and how do we extract that or more even more importantly the truth doesn't just rely on us the truth relies on you too you have to tell the truth too right you have to be reconciled too you have to be healed too you know, it's real good and easy for you to say, oh, well, you know, the indigenous people need to heal from being indigenous, <laughs> right? But maybe, you know, settlers need to heal from being settler and being colonial. Um, so, like I said, we can't, we have, we can't, we can't uh, rest on our, our loyals for being Christian. You know, here's the thing is that when Martin Luther King spoke up, he didn't say, you know, Let's destroy all the churches and all of the 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 the, the declaration and and um, let's destroy all of these these documents that that we hold dear. He wasn't saying anything like that. He was saying, "Live up, live up to your promise. Live up to your promise." And so, you know, I think the church, and I don't want to say the church, the whole the church as the body of Christ, we have to live up to our promise live up to or in or should i say live up to that promise that that god has has promised us live into it be hopeful um and let's not fall into the the trap of empire it's really easy to don't i mean i'm not this is not a criticism this is this is just saying how it is it's easy to fall in empire so um i think and i and i do think that there is there is new wind moving within the church to move away from that. I really believe that. That which, that's what it gives. It does give me hope, um, and I think we all are feeling that hope. Um, you know, in our in, in our in our conversation this evening. So I think I'm going to leave it there. But um, um, I just want the church to live up to its promises. That's all. Um, just want the church to live into who God is calling us to be. That's all. Um, new life from the dead. Do you believe this? Yes. Can we all say we do believe it? Yes. Um, gosh. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Um, thank you. And we've come to the end of our time. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, Lee, Teresa, Vince, and Rosalind, and to my co-moderator, Tim. To our organizer, Adele Halliday, for providing this opportunity of 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. And thank you to you all for attending. So let us close in prayer. Lord, thank you for the words of wisdom shared tonight. Thank you for bringing us together to reflect and hear about this important work within the church, especially the work of anti-racism. Let us remember that our actions today will reflect seven generations forward and that any and all work should honor our generations of ancestors who came before us, as it is they who brought us here and they who remind us of our spiritual connection to Creator God. May the things we have heard stir our hearts and put our thoughts into action. Lord, we pray that as we go our separate ways that you take care of everyone present take care of their families, and show mercy, favor, and abundance over all our loved ones and communities who we do this work for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yawangoa. Thank you all, and uh, thank you to all the participants. Have a wonderful evening.